Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. Today, what do potential U.S. Taliban peace talks mean for Afghanistan's future? Our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab El Din, is here looking out for your live feedback. Tweet him using the hashtag AJStream. Joining him on the orange couch today is Ahmed Shuja, director of the Foundation for Afghanistan. He also writes the blog Afghanistan Analysis. Also with him is Fariba Nawa. She's an award-winning Afghan-American journalist and author of Opium Nation, which we just discussed in the pre-show. We're going to come back to some of those issues momentarily, but thank you both for being with us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Now, remember, as we always tell you, this show is all about you. You can be a part of the stream by liking us on Facebook, post your questions, comments on upcoming topics, as well as your suggestions for show topics here. Right now, Ahmed has got a story that you have shared with us. Thanks, Derek. Bahrain underscore Rev tweeted us a video pointing us to this story. Exactly 11 months after the uprising began in Bahrain, thousands of demonstrators continue to protest, chanting, quote, down, down Khalifa, referring to the longest serving unelected prime minister in the world. Now, this YouTube video shows several thousand Bahrainis gathering outside the UN office in Manama on Tuesday. The police, though present, allowed the protest to continue without any interference. But reports of police abuses continue to surface on social networks. Now, this photo circulating on Twitter shows Nabil Rajab, head of Bahrain's Center for Human Rights, after his detention and alleged beating last week by security forces. Activists cite U.S. and human rights groups' recent condemnations against the treatment of Rajab as the main reason behind police restraint during Tuesday's protests. And here at the stream, you continue to share allegations of protester arrests and videos like this one. It appears to show, as you can see right there, Bahraini security forces <laughs> vandalizing cars in Shia neighborhoods. Of course, we are unable to confirm these claims, but Bahraini activists continue to pressure international organizations like the UN, asking them not to ignore Bahrain. This photo shows UN spokesman Najib Fariji, right there on the right, receiving a letter from a former parliamentarian and opposition figure in Bahrain. And on Twitter, Abu Sabr writes, Dear UN, don't turn a blind eye. There is injustice in Bahrain. And as you can see, this is a picture of one of the protesters at the rally right there in Manama. Now, that's one story you're sharing with us. If you want to suggest an item, tweet it to us using the hashtag AJStream, and you could wind up in the stream. I'm Liz Janes. I'm from Portland, Maine. I'm an artist and I volunteer teaching children in my community and I am in the stream. Secret U.S. talks with Afghan Taliban have reportedly been ongoing for months in Germany. One of the key results of those discussions is the planned establishment of a Taliban political office based in Qatar. The idea is that these official representatives will eventually enter peace negotiations with the United States. After more than 10 years of war, news of this breakthrough prompted considerable discussion, particularly online, from mainstream editorials and blog posts, speculation on the terms and players involved is widespread. Reports of a possible deal include the release of key Taliban officials from U.S. detention facilities. Let's actually take a look at some of these. Now online, the rumors are spreading like wildfire. The stories and headlines are about who would be released, when, and where they might be sent. All of this is circulating throughout the social media space. In reality, peace negotiations haven't begun, and the Taliban office hasn't even been set up, so no one has in fact been released yet. Beyond this guessing game, any U.S. Taliban peace talks will have serious implications for the people of Afghanistan, who will ultimately have to live with its outcomes. Our guests Fariba and Ahmed are both here, so let's jump right into this conversation. Ahmed, I want to start with you. Why now? That's a very good question. It's actually a very big breakthrough because the Taliban, up until very recently, about a week or so ago, had refused altogether to actually negotiate with with the United States because they thought this is an infidel invading you know country. So it's a surprise to a lot of people. But the talks have been going on in the background. There have been attempts by the by the Afghan government, by the High Peace Council, 
uh, whose head was actually assassinated uh, last year by, by a, a Taliban suicide bomber. There have been other attempts by, uh, by the Afghan government to reach the Taliban, but those have been unsuccessful because you have imposters that have, that have uh, uh, you know, uh, contacted the, the Afghan government. You've had the Afghans actually uh, laying down the conditions for talks after some of those uh, mishaps for saying that the Taliban have to have an office for the Afghan government to talk to them. And I think this breakthrough came as a result of some of those secret negotiations and some of these other developments. So you raise a very interesting point in the, with the murder of the Afghan official last year. And a lot of that was based upon, as you mentioned, this idea of imposters. How do you know if you're negotiating with the right people? That's one question that's come up. Another question that has come up is whether or not the Afghan fighters themselves will in fact stand down. Um, this is something that people are questioning. Take a look at this particular clip from a documentary called Taliban Behind the Mask by Norwegian journalist Paul Refstal. <laughs> So this is a big question for uh, when we're considering this issue. How do you know that the higher level commanders and their decision will be carried out by the lower level and some of the younger fighters who've expressed no interest in making peace? Right, that's a very good question. The idea of whether these people in Qatar conducting negotiations on behalf of the Taliban actually represent or have any leverage on the people on the ground who are fighting. And some of these people are younger commanders. They're really not into this whole idea of negotiations, building peace and all of that. They're fighting for a religious cause and they're, and, and they're committed to that. But then similar concerns about representation also go on to the Afghan side because the Taliban have refused to acknowledge the Afghan government. And that means the High Peace Council that was tasked as a primary body to conduct the negotiations of actually is, is now just sitting, you know, uh, not doing anything. But then similarly, the Afghan civil society is there. They have not been included in this. The Afghan political opposition has been included in this, giving concerns to if the Taliban negotiate with the United States, what's going to happen to the, to the gains that have been made by the civil society, by women, by, uh, uh, by the minorities uh, over the past 10 years? What's that, what is it going to mean for them? So let me actually get Fariba's thoughts on this, because some people, the question has been raised about whether civil society is going to have a... a a seat at the table, but some have argued that Afghan civil society does not exist, that it's primarily comprised of foreign NGOs. What's your take? There is a growing movement of civil society in Afghanistan, and I happen to, uh, while I was doing Opium Nation, the book, I was actually writing it at one of these institutions called um, FCCS, and it's a very strong organization. It has many people who participate in it, various programs go on, and we need to support these programs. So it's an emerging civil society is what I would call it. It's not non-existent. And it's very important to include this as well as women and minorities in these talks. And I think the talks are problematic because we don't really know what the talks are. All mm -hmm. this mystery surrounding these talks is making everyone inside Afghanistan uh, very nervous. So we're gonna get into the women and minority issues a little deeper and momentarily, but let's go straight to our community. Well, I think, you know, the first question that was asked, I don't want to regress the conversation, but we asked our community, why now? That same question that Derek asked you. And just a couple, uh, you know, responses. Ali Bome on Twitter saying, because they think it's 1987 again, they want a quick exit out of what they feel is a burden. They're making the same mistake over. Then we also have Amir Ehsan saying, U.S. officials know that the Taliban is unconquerable now, so they must deal with them. We also have Uncle Shubi saying they were warned by the Russians but arrogantly refused. Now it's clear to the USA that they can't defeat Taliban and the future is with them. So Ahmed, to you, uh, and perhaps this last tweet kind of summarizes it, it says, I thought the US said they would never negotiate with terrorists. Taliban defeated them and they are now calling for talks. Is that an interpretation that's valid, that perhaps this means defeat for the U.S.? I don't, I, don't, I don't think we can actually call this a defeat for the U.S. because what the, the U.S. has its own domestic political realities. The U.S. cannot fight, uh, fight indefinitely. What, what I would call this is it's an asymmetric warfare that is going towards a, 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 a stalemate because there's really no political, so, well, no, no military solution, especially given the fact that Americans are actually going to withdraw some of their troops. Right. And so the Taliban 
are a reality in Afghanistan. They're a force to be reckoned with. Now, the, the question is, do we keep fighting them? Do we keep extending the stalemate? Or do we deal with them in, in a different situation, in a different way? But speaking about the withdrawal of troops, it's mm -hmm. interesting you mentioned that. We have a tweet from Sarah Rashid saying, yes, there's also the fear that the Taliban is using the talks as a cover until the U.S. troops leave in 2014, and then they can just resurge. The Taliban could just keep continuing to fight until the, the U.S. leaves. I, I don't think uh, they're using that as a cover. Uh, what the Taliban are doing is actually, they're, they're not negotiating with the United States as an insurgency. They're negotiating with the United States as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, trying to take the yoke of, of foreign imperialism and occupation off from Afghanistan. So they're doing it for their own, for their own uh, uh, benefits and their own propaganda. So a big question that comes from on this whole uh, scope is what is the role of Pakistan? I mean, we've heard uh, talk that the Pakistani ISI, or actually the families of some members of people who are incarcerated in Afghan, in, uh, pardon me, Guantanamo and elsewhere, their families have already been moved to Qatar. The Pakistani ISI, some have speculated that they might actually engage in. Uh, imprisonment of some of these Taliban leaders who are trying to make peace. Isn't Pakistan a strategic player in this? Perhaps they have some interest in maintaining a weak neighbor uh, to their west and not seeing Afghanistan potentially become a client state of India. How can these uh, negotiations have any force if Pakistan is not involved? Yeah, I mean, Pakistan has pursued what they call a, a policy of strategic depth uh, in Afghanistan, which is why they've, they've been involved in some of the instabilities in Afghanistan. But it's interesting because when the families of the six negotiators went, were moved to Qatar uh, from, from Pakistan, they actually looked the other way, sort of tacitly approving taking away the families because that was used as a sort of a chip for Pakistan to put pressure on the Taliban negotiators. So that's sort of a, it, it's, it's a good development, but we really don't know what Pakistan is going to ask for in return and how their interests in, in Afghanistan to keep it unstable are going to reconcile with their, their biggest ally, China's interest in Afghanistan, because mm -hmm. now they have, they have mineral interests there, they have all these other investments coming in. So very good question. The other party that's not included in this is Iran, because Iran has very, very uh, you know, uh, foreign policy considerations about the Taliban coming to the mainstream, but also about the 30 to 40,000 U.S. troops who are going to stay there in, in Afghanistan in non-combat roles past 2014. Wow. So, Oh, God. Uh, well, I want to actually then bring it into a little more into the domestic side of what's happening. And this is a very interesting video that we saw about what's happening with the women of Afghanistan. It was made by Action Aid UK, and it's put out this particular uh, message from some of these women. Take a look. So, Fariba, I would like to put this to you because you've done a lot of work, as you mentioned, with civil society groups in Afghanistan. Some of these women in this video are saying that women are the most vulnerable if there's a return of the Taliban government. What do you think are the prospects for women's rights if there is a reconciliation? It's going to be horrendous. I think the Taliban are worse than they were before 2001. I think they're much deadlier, more savvy, and bitter as a result of 10 years. So I. I fear for those who, are, who have made something. There have been great gains made in, in women's rights inside Afghanistan, but there has been increasing violence because there's a war going on, so the first thing we need is security. Uh, but at what cost? That's really the question. Do women have to give up their freedom for security? And that is something that women feel like they shouldn't have to do. And there, there are 2.7 million girls going to school the, the infant mortality rate has gone down. The life expectancy has gone up from 45 to 62. Uh, these are really important gains for women, and they shouldn't have to lose it. But again, what, what is going on in these negotiations? Uh, Hillary Clinton said that minorities and women's rights are part of these negotiations, but at, to what extent? One uh, contact I had said that the Taliban will allow uh, girls to go to school if there is an imam in the school teaching 
religion. Well, there is already religious studies inside the schools, but so I'm not I'm not sure what exactly they want or if that's if mm -hmm. that's an option or not. Really, there, there's so much hearsay. We don't know what what is going on. What What do you think should be happening? Because obviously, the foreign troops cannot stay indefinitely. What would you like to see? I'd like to see the Taliban checked. If they go unchecked and they're put in power exclusively, women will go way back to, it will be worse than it was previously. I'd like to see them held responsible somehow. Um, and I'd like to see a peacekeeping force inside Afghanistan. And I don't see much discussion about that. Well, and isn't this something that the Afghan people will ultimately have to be responsible for? Ultimately, <laughs> but right now, it, it's a situation where it's not just the Afghan people. You have our neighbors, Iran and Pakistan, causing havoc inside Afghanistan. And the Taliban themselves have been trained in Pakistani schools. I mean, they're not exclusively an Afghan movement. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the problem. So we're getting some interesting tweets on this very topic right now. Yeah, Fariba, speaking of the role of women, we have uh, two comments, actually. One from Mastrelenki. It's a question. He says, why not arm and train Afghan women as bulwarks, so presumably a defensive line of sorts, against the Taliban? That's an interesting idea. Actually, Afghan women are being trained as mm -hmm. police officers and especially as uh, drug agents. I was able to work with them as I was writing Opium Nation and we were able to go on patrol. They're, they're blowing up uh, pots and pans where heroin is being cooked. Right. They're searching. Uh, in fact, there are more and more women smugglers um, and so they're employing more female officers. Uh, but as something that's on a macro level right now, it, it's problematic. Let's actually get in, I want to continue that conversation, but I want to give our audience some context about the uh, drug trade itself. Uh, some of the Taliban officials that have been considered for release have been heavily involved in the opium trade. This particular clip is from Good Magazine explaining the nature of the trade in Afghanistan. Over half the crop comes from Hillman province. This narcotics hotspot also happens to be a Taliban stronghold. Taliban extend credit to farmers and tax their harvest in return for protection from crop eradication. By and by, the tax funds the Taliban insurgency against the United States. All in all, 509,000 Afghani households were involved with opium cultivation in 2008. These farmers, who choose a kilo over the silo, raked in nearly $4,000 a year on average. Legal crops earned only a bit more than half that, about $2,200. However, 98% of Afghan poppy cultivators say they'd abandon opium if they could earn as much from legal crops. Farmers reap only 20 to 30 percent of the country's total profits from the crop. Most of the money winds up in the hands of traffickers, heroin processors, Taliban, other illegal armed groups and government officials. Ahmed, I want to get your thoughts on this. I mean, aren't there so many people involved in benefiting from the drug trade? How realistic could it be that that aspect of this conflict could be ameliorated? Right, and, and that's one of the other basic, basic questions about the talks and the negotiations, because macro level negotiations are never going to, to solve issues that are local level. You cannot, you know, negotiations are not going to address the, 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 the interest of a local warlord or a local Taliban commander or a local smuggler, or it's not going to even provide alternative livelihoods to the farmers who actually have an economic incentive to cultivate poppy. So that, that's, you know, that's a very good question. Let's get some more from our community. Well, on that note, you know, you spoke a little bit about this, but I'm going to try to tie one thing that you said, uh, Farbi, we have from Shuja Rabani on Twitter, uh, echoing your fears about the role of women, saying women and minorities will be most affected if the Taliban are given any senior positions. Um, and he also asked a video question, which I'm going to direct mm -hmm. to you, Ahmed. So uh, let's listen in. This is Shuja Rabani. Hi, my question to your guests on the show today is that uh, without a head of the High Peace Council and with several channels approaching Taliban, are we ever going to come to a common understanding of uh, what has actually been reconciled with the Taliban? That is a very good question, Shuja. You are my namesake. Uh, I think uh, the High Peace Council itself at this point is, is, is not doing much, if anything. The Afghan government itself is not really doing much, if anything. I think uh, you, you mentioned the term, uh, the term reconciliation. I think there's a very fine line. There, in fact, a huge difference between a negotiated settlement and a reconciliation. Because a negotiated settlement is when the Taliban you know, come to an agreement with the other negotiating parties. What a reconciliation does is when you have all the other parties 
negotiating with the Taliban, you're addressing questions of justice, you're addre addressing questions of the Taliban's war crimes. So that is what reconciliation is. The, what we have now are attempts at negotiation and a negotiated settlement. And that is temporary. It does not provide a, a larger But let's look solution. at the interests involved. I mean, from the U.S. perspective, there's a lot of political heat for the country to get out. The American public no longer supports this war. Politicians have their own interest in maintaining or gaining office as well. Is it the realistic that the U.S. And, and the NATO forces will have the same kind of interest in a reconciliation as they would in a negotiation that lets them just leave and save face in doing so? It's a very good question. They don't. That, that, that's a reality that they don't because domestic political pressures with, with the election year coming and President Obama as the Democrat being seen as weak over uh, on, on foreign policy, uh, on, on defense. What, 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 now that Obama has actually assassinated Osama bin Laden, the, the leader of Al Qaeda, what they want really do, uh, from the Taliban in these negotiations is for them to disavow any links with Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And that gives, that is essentially mission accomplished because then Obama can make a domestic argument in the United States and say, we have abolished Al Qaeda. There's only less than 100 operatives there and the Taliban are long, no longer associated with them. So there's really mm -hmm. no uh, you know, um, national security imperatives for us to be there. But then what that doesn't involve is, is, is the, the, the democratic allies of the United States, you know, the civil society groups, people who actually laid down their weapons and actually mm -hmm. participated in the elections. Those are, you know, they're going to be losers if that scenario pans out. Interesting tweet now coming about U.S. and Pakistan. Yeah, we spoke about Pakistan. I figure it's worth uh, sounding this guy's tweet. Fayez Khan Momand on Twitter says, uh, within 140 characters, I might add, U.S. and Pakistan got married 30 years ago, but still they blame each other for their illegitimate child, the Taliban. Would you, uh, what do you make of that tweet? I, I, I think that's a very colorful uh, description. Perhaps <laughs> oversimplified, yes. but... Fairly oversimplified, yes, because uh, the, 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 the U.S. hasn't been really backing and arming and training the Taliban for um, the past at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's been when the Taliban were in power, they were only, you know, uh, um, considered a legitimate government by three governments, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, and they still have their training grounds in Pakistan. The, U the U.S. has not been involved with them for a very long time. Quickly. How does this impact the Afghan government? The, the, recon the negotiation process? Yeah, because they're not included. Right, and, and, and they're, they're not included. I think uh, just before this show, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, uh, actually said that they want the, the, the leadership of President Karzai to be involved in this. But what President Karzai wants is to direct these talks. And I don't know if the, mm -hmm. if the Pakistanis are going to be happy with that, the Iranians were not part of this, or the United States that, that has actually brought this whole thing up to this critical point. I don't think they're very comfortable with it. So, Hold that thought. I want to continue that into the post show. For now, we're going to go to some of the other leads that the stream is following. Ahmed. Thanks, Derek. Today in our lead section, we're giving you a quick look at some of the headlines that we are following. Our first lead is about Reddit, a popular online news aggregator. And according to their official blog, the site will go dark for 12 hours on January 18th to draw attention to the Stop Online Piracy Act being debated by the U.S. Congress. Now, critics say the bill would cripple internet freedom, and instead of featuring user-generated content, Reddit will display a single message about the controversial bill urging visitors to help stop SOPA. Also, in Tibet, a Buddhist monk set himself on fire to protest Chinese rule of the region. SOPA Tulku became the highest-ranking religious figure to commit self-immolation. Thousands attended the funeral, funeral for the popular leader who called for freedom in Tibet. Now, this is the third Tibetan self-immolation in the past week. Our final lead is from Nigeria, where protests over fuel uh, subsidy cuts are entering their third day. In an attempt to curb protest violence, curfews have been declared in three states. Let me just play this video for you. A local media report, uh, reported 16 deaths during the recent unrest, while government figures put the number closer to 10. The stream covered the Nigerian protests earlier this week, and you'll find updates on our website. So those are our leads. For more, you could visit the website and vote for the stories you want to see on a future show. Derek? Thank you, Ahmed. And I want to thank you as well, the both of you, for joining us. We're going to continue our conversation about what is happening in Afghanistan. I want to dive a little deeper into the implications for the domestic life there and for the domestic government. On Thursday, we're going to look at how the outcome of Taiwan's upcoming presidential election could affect U.S.-China relations. For now, join us at stream.aljazeera.com to continue this conversation. Tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. As always, we will see you online.
Welcome to the post show. We're going to continue our conversation about the current or at least the soon to be, it seems, negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban. Ahmed, I want to start with you on this one. Again, Karzai's government seems to be marginalized in this process. Let's see how this plays out. Let's say that the U.S. and the Taliban do come to some kind of agreement that allows the United States and NATO forces to withdraw. What happens domestically? Uh, domestically in Afghanistan, if the Taliban think that after reaching a negotiated settlement with the United States, they can go back home and be accepted by the Afghan people, they are making a huge mistake. It's not only going to be a problem for the Afghan people, but also for the Taliban to actually become mainstream, because you have political opposition that's very strong, because you have the minorities that are that are going to be feel that are going to feel threatened by this by their return. There's, there's going to be the women who are going to feel threatened. There are going to be people who have actually suffered in the hands of the Taliban who are going to demand justice, but in addition. In addition to that, the, the Taliban's crimes are not just political and or killing of humans, but also destroying Afghanistan's domestic cultural heritage, the, the, the destruction of the, the, the Bamiyan Buddhas. They're important mm -hmm. matters that are not going to, be, going to be addressed by a negotiating settlement between uh, the Taliban and the U.S. alone. Mm -hmm. And Fariba, what, what's your position in this? Let's say that this same question, the some kind of uh, withdrawal is made by the U.S. troops. How does Afghan civil society maintain the gains that it has made if the Taliban seek to become reintegrated? I think there needs to be, there will be a civil war if they, if U.S. troops leave. And I don't think they're going to leave completely by 2014. I was hearing rumors in the State Department yesterday that there's, there are many conversations about an extension. Uh, whether uh, Americans want it or not, they're, they're thinking that it's in the interest of the United States to continue um, on, a, on a very small level, though. Well, th whether that's going to make a difference or not, we shall see. But I think people are going to resist, and that includes women and minorities in, in many different ways, as they did before. But this time, uh, I think it, it'll be a much stronger resistance, as Ahmed you know, this becomes an interesting question because if they reduce their troop levels, right, that means that those troops are potentially more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if they're more vulnerable and you start seeing greater loss of American lives, there's only going to be two things that happen from the U.S. policy perspective. Either you surge like they did in Iraq, which means you're back into full-scale firefight, or you withdraw down more completely in response to the political heat at home. So I just wonder, I mean, what's your thought? I mean, it, it seems that there is no simple solution uh, that's available. Definitely, there is no simple solution to this, to this problem because there's so many variables in there. There are so many unknowns right now. What are the incentives for the Taliban to actually stick to what they say at the negotiating table for after when the U.S. withdraws? But to your point about the U.S. troops in diminished numbers being more vulnerable, I think they're not going to be combat troops. All they're going to be is training troops. They're, you know, they're going to help Afghans uh, you know, train. They're going to help uh, with, with operations. They're going to help with medivacs because that's something that the capability that the Afghan troops do not have. Uh, things like that. So they're, they're not going to be combat troops. And so uh, fatalities are going to go down significantly as, if things go as, as they are planned. Our community? Yeah, we have a tweet from Amira Ahsan uh, saying the Taliban's negotiators care about only one issue, winning the release of some or most of their detained comrades. And Ahmed, as you said, you know, it's unlikely that they are going to be willing, regardless of what comes out of these, you know, talks, so to speak, um, be willing to be imprisoned or prosecuted or, you know, punished even to any punitive degree. Um, and as you, I, in the piece that you wrote, you talked about how, um, on this issue, you talked about how there's uh, even people sitting within the parliament who the Taliban might point to. So what, what is the solution? You mentioned transitional justice. What's that? Transitional justice is, is a process for a nation to come together and address previous crimes by, by elements of the society without actually putting people in prison, without violent retribution. It is a, a process whereby the nation comes together and heals. The best example is what South Africa did with the mm -hmm. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. So that, that, that's, that's one solution. Uh, however, that solution is not on the agenda at all. That's not on the horizon at all. Uh, uh, there are so many unknowns, as Fariba said, about these negotiations mm -hmm. that, that it's very difficult to say how things are going to pan out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fariba, I want to get another one of your thoughts. So basically, let's say that the Karzai government uh, is able to maintain itself. How strong do you think its commitment is to some of the kinds of civil society reforms that we're talking about? There's been a lot of in, uh, international speculation that the government is in fact weak and there are concerns about its capability to stand up. 
I don't know whether they're committed or not, because what we've seen, really, the civil society that has emerged has been a people's movement in many ways in Af inside Afghanistan. But it, they have been empowered by these programs, these aid and development programs, and we can't forget those, which includes UN-sponsored programs uh, that, that are helping people stand up against corruption. Uh, the, the media inside Afghanistan has boomed. Whether that will remain or not depends on, so the Karzai government has allowed certain things to happen, like the media, although they're constantly trying to censor on some level, but the media has become so strong, I think, that they can't. Mm -hmm. And even social media, like Facebook and Twitter, many Afghans are uh, active on this. These are in the urban areas, especially. So, I mean, whether the Taliban come back, whether the Taliban and Karzai form a coalition and try to suppress any kind of uprising, we, we will see. But I think Afghans are stronger than they were 10 years ago. Let's get some more comments actually from our community. Uh, forgive me, I was actually looking for uh, something you alluded to earlier in the conversation about what Clinton said. Um, and even though we have comments coming in, I'd like you to comment on this, perhaps both of you. She said, we have not made any decisions about releasing any Taliban from Guantanamo. Now, even though we talked about certain family members being flown to Qatar already, do you both agree with that? I mean, do you think the U.S. government's being transparent here? No. I think, in fact, I think Karzai, there are secret deals going on between Karzai and the Taliban and Pakistan, and we're not hearing about it. This is my thought on it. But uh, I have no evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a, a guess. So uh, really, I'm curious to see what's going to come out of it and who, who are the Taliban at this point. The right. Haqqani network is not involved. Um, and, and the prisoners, which ones are going to be released? So Ahmed, your take? Who are the Taliban and do you, do you think the U.S. is being transparent there? I think there is a lot of room for the rest of the world to know more about what's going on. But then there are also some, some contingencies. They have to keep some things under wrap. But then, obviously, there, there's, there's, there's drawbacks to that. But the Tal there, have been, there have been reports that the Taliban actually want their comrades, the five people from Guantanamo, to go to Qatar, and there they'd mm -hmm. be under house arrest. Mm -hmm. But then, if you actually free these known... As in hardened, bait? Is that what... As in bait, they're trying to lure them there and then put them under some sort of arrest, or you mean? House arrest is, is where, you know, they are not in prison, they're okay. not in That's under guards. Saying. Yeah, house uh, arrest. But, but then if you, if you free hardened known terrorists, but you keep other people w against whom you have no uh, evidence of, of wrongdoing or terrorism mm -hmm. right. for 10 years, and we have had many cases of that uh, going on, uh, there, are, there are serious questions that the U.S. has to actually weigh here. Right. Uh, questions about justice, about fairness, about the rule of law. It's so interesting because it seems like those questions about the rule of law um, become very murky in this context. I was just looking up when you were speaking, Fariba, I was thinking about you brought up the issue of government corruption and I just did a quick search and Afghanistan is currently ranked 180 out of 182 countries in levels of corruption. Uh, it earned a score of 1.9 out of 10 and this report from Business Insider says that in 2010 people from Afghanistan paid two and a half billion dollars in bribes. So I mean what does that say about this whole concept of rule of law? Is it really a question of you know trying to find some kind of parity or justice in the nature of release of prisoners? If there isn't the same kind of transparency even in the prosecution of basic life in Afghanistan. Well, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of discussion about this corruption being endemic or inherent to Afghanistan. That's not true. This is 30 years of war that's caused this level of corruption. And at all levels, everyone's trying to make a living. So bribes are a way of making a living. It's almost become a part of uh, the, li the daily lifestyle. And it's somewhat accepted. I think there needs to be an understanding that some level of corruption will always be apparent in every government, including the U.S. government, including, you know, you have India. But 180 out of 182 countries is not just some level of corruption. Right, I understand. And the corruption is the main problem with this government that we have, it, it, which makes it ineffective and inept. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to understand that the Taliban coming back doesn't mean there won't be any corruption. So, Ahmed, you wanted to get in? Right, and, and to sort of uh, piggyback on what Fariba said, 
there is obviously widespread corruption, and there are reasons, uh, economic incentives for people to actually do some of the, some of the things that they do. But then Karzai has always also been pointing out the the international presence where there's corruption in in the way contracts are, are handed out. There's corruption in the way these uh, private contractors work. But then I think it's it's important to also look at that sort of corruption because when there's so much money coming in, mm -hmm. there is always that you know that, that corruption element there, not only in the Afghan government but also with the wider uh, international presence. The, the aid money that's gone in, we're talking billions and billions of dollars, yeah. there is no system, there is no effective system to funnel that money, to actually get it, you know, 30 only 30% of that money is actually being used on the ground. The 70% is being wasted. So this raises an interesting question because you mentioned before that it's a need for that in the aid to maintain the Afghan civil society. But if that money is indeed being wasted, how do you uh, encourage foreign countries to continue to spend their money, particularly in the wake of a financial crisis that has affected so many around the world? It's, I think the answer is in, in, in institutions. The institutions have been destroyed. We need to rebuild those institutions. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's is the same for democracy. Democracy is a process, and that process has been damaged in the last 10 years, there was an attempt for it to it, but we failed. We're coming close to the final uh, end of the show, but I want to see if we can get some final comments from our community. Yeah, one last comment without speculating too much into the future. Uh, Simon Klingert on Twitter saying, it's important to remember that the Taliban is a fractured movement, not a unified actor. Even if negotiations get on track, they'll hardly be able to deliver. And I know we're running out of time, but I, I would be remiss to not just throw this one quick question to you, Ahmed. Uh, Hillary Clinton today uh, in this AFP wire said that reconciliation can only occur if the Taliban renounces violence and breaks with Al-Qaeda. Those two things alone, is that even realistic? Very briefly. It's a very good question. Renouncing violence. I think if the Taliban really want to be part of the mainstream, they have to renounce violence. Do you think they will? Um, it is very likely, I think, for them to have a political future, okay. they have to. Okay. Okay, so we'll see what happens there. Thank you so much for Riva Ahmed, our own Ahmed at ASC on Twitter. <laughs> great to have you all involved in this conversation and great to have you involved in it as well. Remember, you can continue speaking with us about this. Check out our website, stream.aljazeera.com for more information, including the videos that we've shown you and tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. We will keep following this story and we will see you online.